I wish to thank the organizers first for actually inviting someone from a UK university uh, so close to, his, to the historic sites of the American Revolution. Thanks for that. Um, OK, so final topic for this afternoon uh, is the gravitational wave signal from core collapse supernovae. And as I already hinted, uh, now after the wonderful talk about uh, the prospects of what you can actually do with gravitational wave, it's going to become quite a bit tougher here, but not quite impossible. So I'm happy to acknowledge that more people are actually working on this with me, uh, in particular a student at MPA Garching, uh, whom I'm co-supervising and who's uh, contributed to the new results that I'm going pre to present. And aside from that, there are of course a number of people who you will see on the slides, not only from our own group, uh, whose work I will review just to give you a general background of uh, the gravitational wave signal from core collapse supernovae. So among the many direct and indirect signatures, observables from core collapse supernovae from the explosions of massive stars, gravitational waves are easily the most challenging one, the only one among all these, the direct observations, the indirect constraints from Richter synthesis, uh, remnant properties, and the neutrino signal that we haven't detected yet. So what's in store for us if we do, and why is it actually the case that the gravitational wave signal from core collapse supernovae is much more difficult to detect than all the other signatures, and much more difficult to detect than, let's say, the different binary merger events that we've heard about before. Well, to get an idea about that, simply look at the Einstein quadrupole formula, which tells you, OK, the gravitational wave strain uh, is essentially given by the uh, second time derivative of the quadrupole moment of the system in question, right? And then you can discuss, OK, that will scale uh, with the total mass of the system, this uh, anisotropy parameter epsilon, which tells you about the overall asymmetry of the system, and then something which gives you radius squared and the typical frequency of, or the typical rate of change for your system. OK, so in core collapse supernovae, there are possible ways to get changes of the mass quadrupole moment. The easiest way to do it, and uh, I think the uh, one with the longest pedigree, that's just to do it by rotational deformation, right? So looking at the collapse of a rotational star, uh, you can also get, then, if you have a lot of rotation involved, various instabilities kicking in, which then even make your collapsing core triaxial at some point. Or you can get changes in the quadrupole moment due to these instabilities that are driven by neutrino heating or just inherently by the uh, hydrodynamics of, a, of an accretion shock around a proton neutron star that you heard about in uh, Adam's talk uh, uh, two days ago, right? OK. And the point is now, in the core collapse supernova environment, we're looking at the scenario that, OK, this epsilon anisotropy parameter is very small compared to merger scenarios. Mass is not too high. Velocities are quite a bit lower than the speed of light. So all that gives you, um, tends to give you significantly weaker signals than for any kind of merger scenario. That w that's what makes it tough. So let's consider these different scenarios that I've just introduced. OK, rotational collapse, I think, here, the question of what we expect in terms of the gravitational wave signal is essentially solved. So what we learned uh, a few years ago, uh, due to work by uh, Harald Dimmelmeier and Christian Ott, was basically that due to the relatively uh, homogeneous and, um, and, and robust dynamics of the collapse of a deleptonizing iron core in a supernova, the uh, actual structure of the homologous core as it reaches uh, supranuclear density and bounces is quite robust, right? So you always have the, a similar mass of the of the dense homologous uh, of the homologous core at bounce involved. Uh, changes a bit with uh, the rotational initial rotational energy, and then the deformation is basically given by the amount of rotation that you have in there initially, and then okay when you have such a slightly deformed massive uh, iron core of a massive star, and it bounces. 
There will be some ringing essentially uh, as uh, basically at the frequency of the fundamental uh, pressure mode of this young protoneutron star, as we then call it. And that gives you this typical signature, which now actually doesn't show up. That's too bad. So I'll go. This is ludicrous. Let me just try something. Okay, it's an open office problem. So, yep, it sometimes deletes figures at will. <laughs> but that's what you have, have backups for. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so what you see is essentially at, at bounce, you get one big spike uh, initiating these, these pulsations, these, and then you get a ring down signal, and that structure is very robust, right? You're always at a certain frequency, 750 hertz or so, and then the actual amplitude is determined by the level of rotation, and in terms of, let's go back to the new version now, in terms of the, predict, uh, of the detectability of the signal, you're talking then um, about if you just make sort of rule of thumb estimates, you can imagine that with advanced LIGO, well, you can out, go out to something like 100 kiloparsecs. Actually, if you do the precise statistical analysis, as several groups have now done, there is a very nice recent overview in this, in this uh, paper by Gosson in 2000, 2016. Then you actually find out that with these rotational core bounds for, let's say, the fastest spin rates that you expect, in the, in, of the order of seconds in the progenitors, you can detect those out to a few tens of kiloparsecs, uh, but no more, so you're essentially stuck in the Milky Way. But there is one beautiful thing, uh, and that's deleted now here as well, which is most embarrassing, and which I will, for that reason, just skip. There is one interesting thing, and that is that you can essentially still uh, based on the strength of the signal that you detect in that case, directly infer one-to-one, -one, reconstruct with an accuracy of roughly 20% what the initial angular momentum in your progenitor core was. So that's, for a galactic supernova, quite a powerful potential tool, actually, for determining uh, what stellar revolution gives you just prior to collapse, right? So if you have something with really rapid rotation, hypernova-like, you will actually be able to make out in case of a galactic supernova from this bounce signal, how fast it rotated. Now, following up a bit on the scenario of fast rotation, uh, what are the possibilities that could allow you potentially to even detect these events at larger distances, perhaps beyond the Milky Way? So you may not be limited to the bounce signal alone. What could happen is that for sufficiently rapid rotation, uh, your uh, Proton neutron star may actually be subject to triaxial instabilities of various forms. So it may be a classical hydrodynamical instability um, due to uh, uh, for, for differentially rotating systems that you can have at a ratio of um, rotational energy to potential energy of about uh, 0.09 already. Uh, which can then give rise to a relatively strong and sustained, also very long life signal uh, with a very precise frequency dependence that has been investigated in several papers, both by the, by the Caltech group, by, uh, by the Basel group and, and the Japanese groups which would then look something like this, right? So here you would have the original bounce signal and much stronger a signal from such a triaxial instability. And that could potentially increase the de detectability of your signal out to, well, close to 100 kiloparsecs or so. Still doesn't gain you much, of course, because that only means that you cover the satellites of the Milky Way and don't really go to Andromeda, where the expected rate would go up quite a bit more, right? Uh, there are variations on this theme, so you might, you, we don't really know how long such a triaxial instability might form. It may also uh, come about due to different mechanisms, for example, due to a de genuinely relativistic instability, the R mode instability that could lead to a strong gravitational wave emission. Uh, there are many ideas around, but I would say uh, there are not too many uh, 
too many explorations, thorough explorations of this scenario and simulations that could actually detail, tell us with some confidence of what the signal would really be, what kind of physics we could extract from it, and how far we would be able to detect it. Because the crux is, and you will see that in a second, that generally the more physics you put in, uh, the less impressive the gravitational wave signal of from Coccolab supernovae tends to become. That's a long story. Uh, you will hear one other, another part of that particular story now, as I'm going to discuss the other main source for uh, gravitational wave emission from Coccolab supernovae. And these are these hydrodynamical instabilities that I already mentioned that Adam, and that Adam in his talk two days ago explained in very great detail. So you can have uh, both convective overturn driven by the neutrino heating in the supernova core, right, which creates a changing mass quadrupole moment, and you ha can have uh, these sloshing or spiraling motions, global oscillations of the shock due to a uh, hydrodynamic instability that uh, is related actually to the same instability that makes the boiling kettle whistle, uh, this so-called standing accretion shock instability. Right, and they actually look quite a bit different. So convection tends to give you intermediate scale eddies. Um, the standing accretion shock instability gives you low mode, uh, low mode oscillations by construction. So you can already imagine there will be a different overlap with any quadrupole mode that is it, that eventually radiates in gravitational waves, and there will be a quite a different uh, dependence of the typical uh, timescales and frequencies. And in addition, you can also have gravitational wave emission from another region here, the proto-neutron star interior, which is also convective due to the surface cooling by neutrinos. Okay. So, just to demonstrate that these uh, both of these instabilities actually occur. Uh, here's an explosion uh, model self-consistently computed last year by a student at, at Garching, which actually is triggered by these global shock oscillations which you see in progress now. Mind also here the changing scale down there, which actually uh, tends to obscure that the whole structure is already exploding. So the standing accretion sh shock sloshing has become more and more violent at this point and is actually driving the shock outwards. And now now the shock is continuously expanding and you see convection developing on top of that during the explosion phase. Okay, so what's the question? The question obviously is now, this creates a changing quadrupole moment. What are the signatures in gravitational waves that you actually see from that? Okay, let's go for a 2D example first, uh, simply because it's a bit easier to explain the relevant physics in 2D. The signal is a bit more impressive. And uh, before I do that, one side remark. So if you see here for an example, exemplary case 2D simulation of a rotating uh, massive star with the kind of rotation rates that people like Stan predict, you actually find that this signal from the rotational bounce for the garden variety of Coccolab supernovae is not quite so impressive compared to what follows after from convection and the standing accretion shock instability. That will change a bit in 3D, but more about that later. Essentially, yeah, for the garden variety, this bounce signal over there, that will just be a blip in the signal and not more. Okay, so what's the structure in the signal? What are typical dependencies? If you watch, if you look here at a few uh, representative gravitational wave amplitudes from 2D simulations, you already see a few trends. Well, the gravitational wave emission tends to become a bit stronger for more massive progenitors. That's because they have more mass around in the region between the neutron star and uh, the shock that is heated by neutrinos and in which these hydrodynamical instabilities like convection can develop. And uh, the gravitational wave signal also tends to peak in activity around the time when the explosion develops because at that time uh, the mass involved in phenomena like convection reaches its maximum and afterwards, after the explosion is underway, at some point these convective, these instabilities tend to freeze out and you just tend to have only radial motions. So that's why you have a peak of activity in gravitational wave signal around the time of the explosion. Now the signal here, to go back here, looks uh, pretty damn uh, chaotic, right? Not very organized. 
So, but there is some deeper structure to it. If you just look at the integrated spectrum, you don't see that yet too much either. It just seems very broadbanded, so not much structure there yet. But if you look at the closer at uh, at a part of the, of the real-time signal, you actually find indications that, okay, there may be stochastic variations in the amplitude, but the frequency seems quite robust. So in the time frequency domain, if you do something like a wavelet decomposition, that actually gives you a quite nice structure. So you see quite a narrow-banded emission actually here. Uh, hidden behind this stochastic modulation of the amplitude. So where does that come from? Well, basically the physics in there is that uh, you have excitation by the violent uh, convective motion and standing accretion shock instability in the post shock region of surface oscillation modes in the neutron star, right? So you hit the neutron star, make the surface ring a bit with a particular oscillation frequency, which is set in essence by uh, the surface gravity of the neutron star. Uh, its temperature, for which you can also use the measurable neutrino temperature as a proxy in case of a galactic supernova. Uh, and a few other parameters, right? So gra surface gravity is obviously sent by neutron star mass and gravity. And you may have some relativistic correction factors because the neutron star is extremely compact. So essentially, this typical frequency that you see at around a few hundred hertz or so that peaks, sticks out very prominently in the time frequency domain, that's well understood. And you can relate that to well-defined neutron star parameters. So if you could actually measure that, it, you would have a handle on things like neutron star mass radius and so forth from the gravitational wave signal. Now, unfortunately, things look a bit different in 3D, not fundamentally different, but they look a bit different. Uh, most markedly in terms of the amplitudes of the signal that you get. And this is not simply, a, let's say, a projection effect that you could expect because you're not always looking at the modes in the right direction. What plays a role here is also that the structure of the turbulent motions in the post truck region is different. You tend to break down flows that excite these oscillations in the neutron star surface more. They also tend to come with a frequency spectrum of excitations that doesn't really reach up, doesn't overlap much with the eigenfrequency of the neutron star surface oscillation mode. So that tends to bring the high frequency signal, which dominates much of the, uh, of the structure here, tends to bring that down by a factor of 10 in 3D compared to 2D, right? What you see here in spectrograms of, let's say, contributions to the quadrupole amplitude in different regions of the star is also that if you have these models dominated by global shock oscillations, the forcing by the standing accretion shock instability actually uh, is in a very narrow, much more narrow frequency band. So it comes precisely at, let's say, 150 hertz or so from the fundamental dipole mode, perhaps something else with a, from the quadrupole mode. So it's very narrow. You can't effectively excite these D-mode surface oscillations in 3D anymore. You can still excite them from below by convection in the neutron star surface because that has a better frequency overlap with the, with the surface uh, G-mode oscillation. And the overall effect, as I said, is to bring the amplitudes in the high frequency range down a bit. But if you look at the overall spectra, it doesn't look too different. So you still have relatively narrow banded emission in the high frequency range. And on the other hand, the fact that you're not so swamped by broadband emission uh, from noise in the post shock region tends to bring out the signal from the standing accretion shock instability at 100 hertz, 150 hertz, quite a bit more clearly. OK, so final question is, given this reduction of the signal in 3D and the potentially interesting structure where you have the standing, a band from the standing accretion shock instability, uh, relatively, still relatively narrow band in emission in the high frequency range, which betrays your G-mode surface oscillation frequency. What would you still see in the uh, detectors? And would you be able to extract any physics from that? Now, given the noisiness of the real-time signal that you see, that's quite a challenge. 
Um, so the story, the upshot is then, if you look at the numbers, is that for advanced LIGO, for current detectors, it actually looks pretty bleak. So unless you have massive progenitors which give you a stronger gravitational wave signal, you tend, in terms of the measurable power excess uh, beyond the detector noise, you tend to barely reach the limit of detectability at a supernova distance of 10 kiloparsecs. So that's what you see here in these numbers. What we have here are numbers in this table for two different progenitors, parameterizing the excess power that you would get during the, let's say, first second of a supernova, which you could pinpoint from the neutrino signal, which you get at the same time. Uh, and you'd need, because the signal is not so clearly orderly structured, you'd need quite a big number here, so you'd need about 12, 15 here, and you only get that for the massive progenitor, 20 solar mass progenitor in our recent study. Um, but with third generation institutes, uh, instruments like the planned Einstein telescope, that would look quite a bit different, and you would actually be able to see, see reasonable uh, supernova gravitational wave signals throughout our galaxy, you would be able to come up with a clear detection. And within our galaxy, you would even be able to uh, perhaps extract some physics of the signal because uh, the low ratio of the excess power due to the gravitational wave signal from the supernova in the low and high frequency band, that depends very much on what kind of signal component you excite in the progenitor. And that depends on whether you have large scale shock oscillations at relatively low frequencies, or whether you have this high frequency signal dominated, dominating which is excited by high frequency uh, fluctuations in the proton neutron star convective region. So that would allow you by sort of extracting a color in terms of a ratio of power in low and high frequency band, by extracting that kind of a gravitational wave power or yeah, effective frequency, saying whether you have a lot of a base section there or not, right, would allow you to pinpoint whether your galactic supernova actually did show <coughs> activity in the standing accretion shock instability or not. Especially if you also combine that with timing information from the, neut from the neutrino signal and potentially time frequency uh, information from the neutrino signal, which could give you supplementary information due to fluctuating neutrino emission about any hydrodynamical instabilities like the so shock sloshing motions which you saw in that movie here, which you could potentially then use combined with the neutrino signal for very close supernova, right? Distance of, let's say, the Crab supernova, two kiloparsecs, to actually give you two relevant frequencies of the system combined, so a G-mode surface frequency and, let's say, a sloshing frequency of the standing accretion shock instability, and that together could potentially potentially allow you to, let's say, really disentangle at a given time the shock radius in a supernova, neutron star radius, with more information from the neutrino signal, even the neutron star mass or so. So potentially, if we're very lucky and get a galactic event, this could actually be very powerful. And this may be quite optimistic, but I'll just remind you, okay, for supernova 1987A, we had to live with some two dozen neutrinos. We still made a lot of that. Okay, yeah, so that brings me to my conclusion. So uh, I think I hopefully have demonstrated to you that in some rare cases, so if you have a rapidly rotating galactic supernova, we, we could detect the signal from the core bounds, or if you have a really close supernova of the garden variety where the gravitational waves come from convection and the standing accretion shock instability that you would still have quite a powerful diagnostic in the form of gravitational waves, right? Maybe tough, so that's a perspective that may take something like 15, 20 years or so uh, to materialize if we have the proper detectors and if we're lucky and have a galactic supernova. So the question is obviously that remains for the future in this field is can we come up with other uh, interesting scenarios that could actually allow us to detect supernovae well in gravitational well, waves well beyond our own galaxy? I outlined a few of those possibilities. So with 
rapid rotation, you certainly have possibilities, all these kinds of triaxial instabilities. I think more needs to be done in terms of simulations and what I said today, restricting myself more or less to the potential of a galactic supernova may actually be overly pessimistic. Well, it's the latest state of the art in theory, but we should always be open for surprises and maybe uh, we'll actually be surprised in a positive way and the what future instruments come, or current instruments come up with in the next few years actually give us some reason to change the latest state of the art in theory once again. Okay. With that, I conclude and thank you for your attention. Uh, you went in talking about surprises. Well, yes. It should be no surprise that nature probably confuses all these things, all these effects together. I just. What I'm familiar with in literature is people study the effects in, independently. So rotation uh, as one model, uh, convection and sassy is another. But what actually happens is most likely some confluence, a combination of these effects. Yeah. And I just wonder if those can somehow couple to give you a, a stronger gravitational wave, maybe give us a more optimistic future. Well, I think probably if you have something like a triaxial instability, it will probably swamp everything else. Uh, concerning, let's say, the signal from the rotational core bounds, it's always coming in at a specific stage, so it's always separated by construction, more or less, uh, in terms of the period when you see it. It's always in around 10, 20 milliseconds around bounce. So in that sense, you would always be able to tell it apart. Uh, but I agree that potentially, well, the the complex interplay that you have in the in the uh, in Cocolab supernovae and the different explosion mechanisms that are on the market could well, yeah, certainly let's say lead to lead to things like okay, we have uh, for some reason a triaxial instability which kicks in much more strongly because of some interplay with the, with the neutrino cooling in the neutron star surface or whatever. Uh, it's, well, yeah, it's, it's a good question and it's just uh, basically another reason to, to be open for surprises, I would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Would the models you're considering have given you three, four, five hundred kilometer per second neutron star kicks? We haven't evaluated th that, but let's say from the mass in the gain region ejection speed, I think, the 20 solar mass model that you saw here would give you roughly that, that kind of kick easily. I, I guess I didn't have a question, but more a comment. I mean, people can argue whether or not uh, how detectable these things are, but people are going to search no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, just for the observers, you make sure for the nearby supernova, try to constrain the explosion times because people are going to really want to at least look in the LIGO data stream for these things. Make sure you're turned off. <laughs>